right. So today, um, Brian and Mike asked me to talk to you a little bit about what's uh, the plan for ClickHouse in 2024. For those of you that have followed us for a while, beginning of every year, we publish an issue on GitHub where we say this is what we are going to do this year. Uh, from an open source perspective, we actually have been pretty transparent about what we're building in cloud as well. Um, we just hold, held uh, what we call the ClickHouse Cloud Live Call, where we basically detailed our plans. So this presentation is going to be just highlights from both of the um, sources, and then I'm going to kind of give you some additional resources to go back and um, get more details uh, if you're interested. Let me actually maybe start a little bit with, you know, in terms of like what we focus on, how fast we move, and what, what we've been up to for the past six months before I go into the roadmap. A few of the kind of the wish list uh, features that have been mentioned actually have been in development for the past six months and are already existing in the experimental uh, mode. So refreshable materialized views, that's something that we've been wanting to do for a while. Um, this has been actually a community contribution. One of the things that ClickHouse does really well is it leverages not only a community of professionals that want to contribute back to the project, but also university students. So some of the best database programs actually have graduate students that take ClickHouse as um, the, the basis for graduate student projects. And sort of we draw upon that community to help us maybe kickstart some experimental features. So Refreshable Materialized Views was one of these uh, that was externally contributed. It's not yet production ready, uh, but we're hoping for it to get there. Uh, and at that point, it's going to be enabled by default in ClickHouse Cloud. Um, right now, you can try it, uh, but it's it's not uh, going to kind of, kind of work uh, perfectly. So we this is why for production you know, deployments, we prefer you know either workarounds. Um, it's just going to be more stable that way. Another uh, capability that was mentioned was semi-structured data. So JSON support. Um, the, the first speaker, Chase, uh, said, why is it that I have to take JSON and parse it into uh, you know, a structured data with maps? And the truth is, this is actually going to be the fastest way for you to read JSON, you know, pre-parsing it and putting it in structured data. But it's not the most convenient. And if your uh, JSON is messy and changes, this is just you know, really difficult to do. Um, so we're working on full semi-structured data support. This is something that Elastic supported and was like really known for. You just take any JSON, throw it at the system, and it just sort of figures out how to how to interpret it and kind of basically index it for you. Uh, there were some limits with that. Uh, frankly, again, even at Elastic, people liked to pre-parse JSON in situations where performance was key because Elastic at some point, Elasticsearch at some point would just kind of you know have too many fields and that's it. Like your queries are very slow. Um, so we're trying to not repeat some of these. You know, these problems uh, and kind of, you know, that's why we had an experimental version of a Google JSON object out for a while. It actually is used um, at scale in many production environments, even though we discourage it, but it does have limitations. So as a result, before we fully call J uh, semi-structured data production ready, we're reworking it quite a bit. We actually went to the basics. We introduced something called a variant data type. It's currently experimental. And now we're working on the next version of our JSON data type, as we're calling it. Uh, and that's going to be, we believe, the production-ready version um, of what we, we think semi-structured uh, data support should be. So the variant data type is a building block. The JSON data type was actually just merged last week, uh, should be in the next release. And hopefully after that, uh, we will see semi-structured and be officially sort of like blessed as production-ready um, in, in the full product. So it's coming. Um, it's something that we've been working on for a while. And again, taking lessons learned from other systems. Anyway, last six months, there's a lot there um, in the database, but also we have a team focused what we'll call integrations. Um, so, you know, we integrate with many tools out there. Uh, so you talked about the the use of um, Superset. That's, you know, business critical in terms of uh, providing analysts with access. But there are many other BI tools that we build integrations with and that build integrations with ClickHouse. Here's just some examples from the last uh, six months, you know, QuickSight, Looker, Looker Studio, Power BI, Tableau Online. Uh, these are kind of obvious market leaders. Uh, there's something called Real Data, which is kind of a, a, a new, very interesting operational BI vendor out there uh, recently um, built a connector to ClickHouse. On the observability side, the first speaker talked about, um, you know, the SQL-based observability, uh, which is something that we're kind of seeing more and more. And I'll talk about that on the roadmap side, but we recently uh, updated our Grafana connector, which is, again, critical if you're going to use ClickHouse for observability to their version 4. Uh, and that has uh, some really new cool capabilities that I'll talk about. And then there's a bunch of, again, tools that have built integrations and announced them recently. Uh, some of them for CDC, some of them for ETL, some are streaming platforms that now natively integrate with ClickHouse. 
And then last but not least, cloud, of course, we've been busy here as well. We have our offering now in GA, in AWS and GCP. Azure is coming next. We're very excited about that. Um, and, uh, you know, we roll out new regions based on customer demands. Uh, we've built a product called ClickPipes, which is just sort of like a UI-driven, uh, very easy way to onboard data from uh, streaming sources like Kafka. You can see a bunch of Kafka-based systems here. Uh, and more is on the way. So the goal is, again, just to reduce that time to... Uh, sort of value when it comes to new use cases across different domains. We have something called SQL Console. So this is a UI you would use to interact with ClickHouse uh, in cloud. And there, of course, we had to add AI-based copilot. Who has not added a UI-based copilot to their product this year? Come on, you had to, right? So yeah, so we, of course, did that as well. Um, and, uh, you know, security, of course, you always have to have a secure product. All right, so that's the last six months. So now I'm going to talk about the roadmap, and I'm going to start um, with actually a use case focused view. I kind of played around with different views last um, year. I think uh, I just went like core database integrations cloud, like I just showed here. But it got really messy. I realized that we're building features across use cases in all three. And then it's sort of hard to understand, like, where are we actually going as a company? So I was like, okay, let's actually start with use cases. Like, how do people use ClickHouse and why is it that we're investing in this versus that. It's hard to boil down use cases for a database as broad as ClickHouse, but we tried and we ultimately came up with this. Real-time analytics, which is, you know, think of that as using ClickHouse as a database for for like any, say, SaaS offering that has any sort of interactive data-driven views. And, you know, an example would be Common Room. So they have an interactive view they have to expose to users. By the way, we're happy users of Common Room. Uh, and I know how fast and interactive that UI is. Without that, I wouldn't use it, right, as a product professional. So anybody building kind of these analytics into their product could benefit from a database like ClickHouse as opposed to, say, Postgres or MySQL, which are great for transactions but not for analytics. There's business intelligence, which is taking that but exposing it to your internal users. So this is exactly the Microsoft use case, right? Like, why shouldn't my internal analysts have the same really fast experience uh, powered by ClickHouse for, especially for use cases where, uh, the, the, you know, the interaction needs to be that uh, sort of, um, you know, that unique in terms of how you uh, analyze data. So A-B testing is actually a very common use case uh, for that for internal analytics. Observability, logs, events, traces, you name it. There's all kinds of signals. We're not an observability solution, but if you're building a platform for observability and you're looking for a data store in that platform, ClickHouse is a great one. And finally, AI, right? So even before AI was cool, ClickHouse was already uh, often a feature store for uh, organizations that have had this concept. Um, a feature store is just, you know, what are features, right? It's ultimately just structured data with a bunch of attributes that you use, you know, in an online and offline use case. Uh, but this uh, use case certainly has grown in terms of its provenance in the past year, again, for obvious reasons. So here are the four use cases that we see kind of as a business that we invest in. And so our roadmap really breaks down into investments into each one. And for real-time analytics, again, this is just a sort of a diagram of how you would imagine sort of ClickHouse being uh, used there. The important part is, again, getting data in. Often streaming data sources are important. There's a bunch of features in a database that need to be there to support it. Uh, and then finally, there's, you know, language clients and in some cases UIs, although again, less important because usually it's an embedded database. So from a roadmap perspective, again, going left to right, um, the most, and again, I had to pull out specific highlights. This is not the full roadmap, but I had to pick something, right? So the biggest things I would say for this use case on the database side, I already mentioned the important, uh, importance of kind of streaming data insert. One problem that we see consistently, especially from users coming from non-analytical database to ClickHouse, they just insert row by row, right? And that's not good for an analytical system. It's not how the best practice, you know, but you get tired of sending people to docs and say, hey, you should insert in batches. Much better just to batch inside ClickHouse. So we, we've had uh, this concept, we call it async inserts. You know, you send us data row by row, we basically accumulate it until a batch is complete and we write it for you. But it wasn't turned on by default. Again, you had to tell people, you know what, go turn on this feature, it's going to do it for you. Why not just turn it on by default? The reason is it's it slows certain things down if you don't build it right. So we had to actually invest quite a bit into it at adaptive thresholds, a number of features. But we believe at this point, we're ready to turn it on by default. And again, it's going to be much easier for any new user, you know, like Kirill coming over from Postgres, who just gets started with ClickHouse and not have to know all of these things necessarily ahead of time 
in terms of best practices for how to write. Um, the next one is lightweight updates. I think somebody else uh, mentioned this. I forget who it was. So this is a feature, again, we've been working on uh, for quite a while. We have lightweight deletes right now. And the difference from uh, a regular sort of alter delete is that uh, we use tombstones, right? So the delete sort of happens right away, but then we kind of clean it up uh, in the background. Lightweight updates will, will work in a very similar way, except you have to kind of keep patches, right? It's the differences between uh, sort of previous state and current state. It's much more complex to build, but at this point, we have a really good plan and we believe it'll be here very soon. I would say, you know, this uh, first half of the year, we should, um, we should have it uh, out in the market. So those are the big two on the database side. On the integration side, again, more kind of streaming data sources. The biggest ones we're working on are Amazon Kinesis uh, and Google Dataflow. Uh, those are um, sort of the, the biggest that we currently don't have. I already mentioned some of the other ones. And then on the uh, cloud side, we're looking at a really neat feature that we've heard about from a lot of developers, which is publish SQL queries and API. So again, I'm prototyping. I'm uh, sort of you know coming up with uh, a, a new concept, and I want to very quickly have an API that another developer can hit in order to continue developing the application. Right? I have to write a bunch of boilerplate code. How cool it would be if you just wrote a query and we published the REST API and your developers can go hit it. So that's um, kind of on the cloud side. And again, the, the theme on the cloud usually is the building blocks are already there. The database and integrations, we just kind of add more tools uh, to kind of make productivity go faster. But the the kind of the, the, the features are already there um, in the core database for your use case to be successful. All right, business intelligence. So this is internal users. Again, very similar diagrams, but ecosystem becomes even more important, especially the BI tool ecosystem. So, you know, some of the features on a database um, that I think are very important to this use case, parallel replicas, this is um, actually critical in our cloud offering. Uh, when you have especially very large um, queries running in a compute uh, and storage separated environment, you have to use uh, resources of kind of all of the compute replicas. Uh, that are talking to that same object storage. This feature is called Parallel Replicas. Uh, it is currently technically experimental, uh, but the reason it's experimental is not because you shouldn't use it uh, in production at all, is that, again, we're not turning it on by default yet for all queries. We actually, our users today do use it for specific queries, but you have to know, you have to be like, okay, this query needs Parallel Replicas and this one doesn't because it'll be slower. That's obviously not acceptable. This is not a scalable way to use a feature. Um, you can sort of ask one of our users who is in the room today, it's kind of a pain, right? So this is something that uh, we're urgently working on one of our top priorities. Again, this feature, even though, you know, I'm talking about it in the context of cloud, this is a feature of our open source product as well. Uh, this is something that is available as a building block. Uh, joins was mentioned. So joins, I, I kind of often hear like, do joins even work in ClickHouse? They do. Like unlike Elastic, which was like very anti-join, you shall not join data in Elasticsearch. Uh, we have joins. We support joins. You kind of have to know what you're doing. You have to tune the join, which is not a good experience for ad hoc queries. If you've got internal users who themselves are writing the join, they're not going to know that, hey, you know, you got to write it this exact way to be fast in ClickHouse, right? It doesn't work. So we're working on a project called Analyzer to automatically uh, be able to do cost-based optimizations and join rewrites. Uh, so your, your user can write a join. It's not quite the ClickHouse join. That's okay. We're going to rewrite it because we know uh, based on statistics and based on uh, the syntax that there's a better way uh, of, of actually e executing this join on, on a system that you have. Um, this project has been in uh, the works for a while. I talked about it last year when I was here. It takes that long sometimes. In the last, I think, dozen of tests is being finished right now to enable Analyzer by default, and then the automatic rewrites are going to start. Again, hopefully this first uh, part of the year, uh, we will see this. Uh, project complete. Adaptive threshold for spilling data to disk. Again, this is about big queries. Right now, you know, your queries typically run out of memory and that's it. And this is a good experience for real-time analytics, but maybe not for more kind of kind of data warehousing use cases. So you see at the top, increasingly we see a use case where ClickHouse is used kind of as a speed layer for existing data warehouses or data lakes, or maybe even an alternative to uh, data warehouses and, and data lakes. Uh, sometimes we even call this concept a real-time data warehouse. Um, the idea is that, well, why do you need a traditional data warehouse when you just need much faster experience with the same huge amount of data? So we take this use case very seriously. There's still a lot of work to do, but uh, we are on it. And last but not least, transactions. Uh, this is a concept that, again, has been in development for a while. 
Uh, frankly, we kind of stopped development on it after initial release for at least half a year, but we're coming back to it. Right now, it is only available for non-replicated table engines, which is, that's that's the minority there. Most people run ClickHouse in a replicated mode, so we need to shore that up and complete that. On the ecosystem side, I mean, there's a huge ecosystem. We support DBT. This is a big one for a lot of folks um, that are kind of data, kind of engineering, data warehousing community. We continue to keep up with their crazy uh, new versions that they bring out every month. Just a lot of usage out there. Fivetran is, is is a kind of new connector that we're working on. For a long time, that ecosystem was closed, but they opened it up. And now we can develop a connector for Fivetran. So these are just two kind of ETL or ELT tools that are out there that are quite popular. I already mentioned BI tools. Right now, we're actually working on certification for Tableau and Power BI. Uh, pretty excited about that. Um, again, if you know, for many, I mean, Power BI is huge. Uh, a, a lot of people uh, require it for uh, adoption in this use case. And then data lakes. Like, I don't know what the opinions are for folks here in terms of, you know, the data lakes versus data warehouses. We're Switzerland here. Like, we will read from anything and we will write to anything that uh, our users want us to. Uh, so we added support for Iceberg, um, but it's not complete. So we're going to be improving that with the Iceberg REST catalog. No, we also have support for Delta Lake and Hootie. In the end, again, if the d- data is somewhere and you want us to kind of read and write it, we will do it. But right now, again, this support is for ad hoc queries, right? This is about sort of reaching out and kind of having a federated query out to your uh, data lake. And then again, on the cloud side, it's about uh, faster time to value. Uh, I talked about click pipes. That's the kind of the easy way to onboard data. So we're going to be looking for a stateful uh, large data loads from object stores to be done through click pipes. It's possible today, but it can be brittle if you just do it through like an insert query in the end. You know, like if you've got a multi-day upload, you don't want it to be interrupted by a network disconnect somewhere. So we're going to have a stateful process that manages this upload for you. And we do have customers who upload data for days, if not weeks sometimes. It's just what it takes uh, for huge uh, workloads out there. So that's coming. And then um, actually just had a request today before the, the meetup to have ad hoc queries from, say, BigQuery. So that's something we'll be working on as well. I uh, already mentioned the AI-based co-pilot. Of course, you need that. Observability. Um, so in this use case, some of structured columns and variant and JSON data type support that I talked about earlier, that's a pretty big one, actually, for um, for a lot of logs are in a JSON format. And they're not, even though if they're structured, it's really hard to predict um, what the schema will look like. So we get a lot of requests uh, for this across use cases, but definitely in the observability use case. The other two are inverted indices support. So this is for faster full text search. Uh, it exists. It's not production ready. So we need to put a lot more work into it. And finally, um, in the metrics use case, uh, one of the requests we have is ba- basically being a drop-in uh, replacement for Prometheus. It's a well-loved system, but at scale, uh, it often has many operational challenges. So uh, users who get to a certain scale with Prometheus say, hey, wouldn't it be great if ClickHouse could handle our metrics workload? Well, we didn't have to change our dashboards. We didn't have to you know, completely revamp everything around it. And guess what? It's an open protocol. It's actually not a difficult query language to implement. So we'll try. This is already in progress. And on the integration side, open telemetry is the basis of our data shipping right now. You don't have to use open telemetry to use ClickHouse for observability. It's just a good starting point. And this is a way for us to kind of have a bunch of templates out there. You can, of course, have a different schema, but it's a good inspiration if you're just getting started. And I already mentioned the Grafana. This is the UI that we recommend and we are jointly developing and you know have been for the past two and a half years uh, plugin uh, for ClickHouse. We just recently completely uh, changed kind of the navigation. It's much easier now to have your, especially kind of logs and traces in ClickHouse powered by Grafana. The workflow is as good as na- uh, native systems that Grafana has, which is low key and tempo. So, um, you know, pretty happy with how that's turned out. And on the cloud side, again, we just try and make it um, a little bit more easy for cloud users where we can. We ourselves run our own um, internal observability deployment on ClickHouse. So we know, you know, what it takes specifically to stand up in ClickHouse. Uh, so we have detailed guidance that's coming uh, from our internal observability team. This blog actually is going to be imminently published uh, and available to the community uh, to kind of at least learn from our experience. Last but not least, uh, AIML, Gen AI use cases. Again, there are many use cases. If I go to the previous diagram, it's not like just one use case. Uh, you know, for some of our customers, you know, like what what they're really kind of like trying to figure out right now is 
which data sets should I even leverage for certain types of, you know, kind of data science or machine learning? And that's an exploratory use case, right? This is not necessarily a use case uh, where you're already building production systems, but ClickHouse can play a role. So I'll talk about that. Uh, you may be building um, various applications uh, and you may need, for instance, uh, in addition to uh, heuristics-based analytics vector search. And so this is something that our users ask us about. And finally, you may need to observe your kind of new applications and pipelines. And again, I already talked about observability. So it's not just one use case. So what's relevant here? Vector search is relevant if you are going to actually store vectors and search them. I was happy to hear um, that, uh, you know, this is already happening uh, in some of the, our speakers earlier. Uh, but we want to make it faster. So right now we, we're doing detailed benchmarking. Linear scans are actually really quite competitive. Those are kind of precise scans you would do if basically, you know, you don't want any approximation. And it works for certain use cases. Uh, ours is pretty competitive. But if you want to leverage, for instance, annoy indices, or there is an HNSW index uh, that we have support for, both of those right now are experimental, so not, not production ready. And again, based on our benchmarks, not quite there. So we have a lot more work to do there, but we're actively investing in making those really fast and production ready. We won't call them production ready until they're fast because that's our brand. Uh, that's something that, again, we take very seriously. And then for exploration, um, I don't know if you saw the announcement. We recently joined forces with a really cool and increasingly popular project out there called CHDB. This is uh, actually an in-process library based on ClickHouse for in-process analytics in Python. Uh, there's many other language bindings in the data science community. This is pretty important. So this uh, value of local and embedded analytics is really key to the way kind of data scientists do exploration. Often, again, they may reach out, say, to a data lake where they have a bunch of data sets. They may do kind of a small subset of da data as a, as a sample, basically, before they recommend a particular approach to uh, learning or before they recommend uh, some way the data sets should be prepped. So CHDB has been out there, uh, received a lot of um, sort of attention and praise. We've been working very closely with the creator and really happy to have him on board as of last week. And so we'll be investing a lot more in this. Data science exploration is not the only use case. Another use case is we see in specific applications actually just take kind of analytics and build it into the application itself. This is increasingly popular in BI. So this real data operational BI uh, tool that I mentioned, this is exactly what they do, right? They speed sort of up the actual charting and, and analytics by using an, an embedded analytics library in uh, their product. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in that um, space. And then the AI ML ecosystem, again, really vast. There's so many players out there, but you know we're trying to keep up. You know, as I mentioned, Feature Store is one use case in which uh, ClickHouse is popular. So we're starting with some integrations there. And then for um, kind of building LLM applications, we recently announced integration of Llama Index, which is one of the popular frameworks. And you'll be seeing a lot more. Uh, again, there's just uh, a lot going on there uh, in this space. On the cloud side, productivity tools, we're adding, um, again, a RAG uh, workflow type of tool. So if you want to just generate vectors and store them directly in ClickHouse. This is something that we'll be supporting. We're going to be providing access uh, to public data sets, which already a lot of them are available on ClickHouse Playground, just maybe not exposed uh, as easily. We're going to have this concept of an instant attach where you don't have to load them into your service. You'll just connect to them and you'll be able to read them uh, directly. Uh, and then uh, finally, support for executable UDFs. This is something that is available in open source, but we're going to be exposing it in a secure way in our cloud uh, service. So that was a lot of information, specifically on the open source roadmap. Um, just to kind of cap it off, specific to the cloud offering, uh, I just added a few slides since maybe not everybody is familiar here. It's what you'd expect, right? There's an operational dashboard kind of for an admin. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a SQL console for an analyst. Uh, that's kind of in a nutshell what the UI of the offering would look like. Behind the scenes, the, the architecture is separation of storage and compute. So the storage is backed by object store. There is a caching layer. So we do use local SSDs for caching. And I'll talk about the importance of that in a minute. And I'll talk about, a little bit about the um, this Amazon Express layer, which was mentioned earlier, just a potential role that could play. Compute is completely kind of stateless, right? So in the end, you've got your storage, your compute. You know, you can you know scale it up and down. You can uh, horizontally add replicas. Uh, it's much easier in this kind of architecture compared to shared nothing architectures. So let's talk about caching. So currently, the cache that we have in our cloud offering is local to each node. 
this has its limitations. Uh, we've done a lot of optimizations. We have concepts like cache pre-warm. So we do everything we can to make this cache work really well. But we realized after some time that really what we need is a distributed caching service that's going to make it even more flexible uh, to kind of just kind of add cash on demand uh, and, and leverage that. This is where we think we can leverage uh, AWS uh, Express uh, OneZone, whatever the name is. The reason we couldn't use it as the main data store for our service is because it's not multi-region. So, and, and this is an issue for us. Like it's, we need to build a reliable service. But for this use case, it actually would work uh, potentially very well. So this is something we'll be looking at. We also have uh, already prototyped and um, are starting to roll out uh, this concept of stateless workers. We're going to start with merges. Many use cases, especially at scale, uh, your background processes like merges could be a significant impact on uh, performance of the query. Uh, so it's something that we want to potentially offload to workers that can just kind of pick up that workload as needed, especially because it is more bursty in some cases. Uh, you know, you issue, say, a delete command, a bunch of merges happen in the background. You don't want that to to affect kind of your, your service, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis. But at the same time, there are going to be still stateful workloads that actually we're going to also invest in this compute-compute separation concept. So I think it was Common Room that mentioned um, ability to separate your inserts from selects. Uh, that's something that will be coming to ClickHouse Cloud. And by the way, everything I'm sharing here, we shared in this ClickHouse Live call in the beginning of the year. We'd like to build in the open, whether cloud or open source. So um, yeah, you can, you're can. you welcome to take uh, screenshots, but all of this information, uh, including the decks, uh, is available. And I'm happy to kind of put you to places to go see more detail. On the cloud provider expansion side, as I mentioned, uh, we are eagerly waiting um, our, our Microsoft Azure service. We have many uh, users on a wait list uh, waiting for this. You know, definitely there's going to be a, a pretty big pent up demand that we'll be able to meet with this new offering. We're also um, starting with AWS going to be adding a new deployment mode called Bring Your Own Cloud. It's um, still a separate storage and comp compute offering, uh, but the difference is the data plane would be able to be run in a customer's VPC. Uh, so again, this is deployment mode is not for everyone. It's definitely a lot more operations intensive, but for re regulatory reasons, some customers uh, need this mode of deployment. So this is something that we'll be adding later this year. All right. There are many other things on the roadmap that I'm not going to go into too much detail. Of course, there's always more security and reliability um, sort of controls and operational improvements. And I already mentioned the SQL console. So there'll be a lot more improvements uh, coming to that. And then uh, last but not least, compliance. Uh, this has already uh, been a, a big uh, sort of thread for us. We have SOC 2 compliance and ISO 27001 compliance. And we'll be adding HIPAA later this year, PCI. And finally, um, federal and FedRAMP. This is going to be a longer road for anybody that's taken that path. But do know that we are on it. It's going to be, again, a multi-year journey, but no getting away from it. Definitely seeing demand. So we'll be investing that over the next years. If you would like more information, I already mentioned the ClickHouse Live call. That's on our YouTube channel. Uh, and there's a lot more information on it also around our monthly community calls where we talk about our open source releases. Uh, probably the best way to keep up with all of this is to sign up for our newsletter. So just FYI, like if I, I was just thinking like, how, how would you even know that there's something new posted there? If you're on our monthly newsletter, we promise not to spam you too much. Um, it's, it's, this information will be there. You'll get both kind of the ahead of time notification as well as the recordings. Thank you very much. If there's any questions, please let me know.